Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Adventure Metrics Podcast. I'm Matt Horwitz. I'm Scott Brills. And today we have an awesome guest, Janice Waugh. Janice is an author, blogger, and speaker who in 2009, from a love of travel and a personal loss, decided to step out and embark on solo travel. She carefully observes how and why she travels, and her writings at solotravelerblog.com have reached thousands. Janice also co-founded the Global Bloggers Network, an online research resource for bloggers, and Full Flight Press, where she publishes a series called The Traveler's Handbooks, each written by a top niche blogger. Janice, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, Welcome. thank you so much. <laughs> and for bearing with me, I, I'm sick this morning, and it's not only is my it, it messes up, I can't even read properly. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing just fine. <laughs> So Janice, uh, Scott, one of the things I first said, Janice, I said, wow, you're doing, you're doing so many things. It's, it's, um, I find it fascinating to speak with individuals like yourself and find the first question always challenging. It's kind of like where to start and, and where to probe. Where do you like to start when people ask you kind of like, you know, how did you start the blog or when did you begin travel? You know, how far back in time should we start here? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my idea, my, my thought about travel started actually when I was about 10 with my mom and she was describing, I lived in Montreal, I grew up in Montreal in my younger years. She was describing going to the Eastern townships and staying in hostels and hiking between hostels. And at 10 years old, you I have a cool was, mom. <laughs> I thought that was the most romantic idea ever. Like it was the romance of it that did it for me more than anything. And uh, five years later when I was 15, I went on my first trip. Um, it was a cycling trip through England and Wales. And um, uh, for a month, and wow. uh, going from hostel to hostel. And when my mom turned 80, the whole family went to Cuba to celebrate. And I realized that that was the next time that I traveled with my family of origin. So 14 to when my mom turned 80. So it was about 60 years or something like that. I don't know. I don't do the math. <laughs> But really, she just set me on this course, and um, and so you know, from then on, it was uh, I traveled, I traveled, and I found ways of traveling even at sixteen and seventeen that I could get, I could sneak by my parents and go, okay, yeah, I guess that's good enough, that's safe uh, enough. And one thing it. of being the rebel, it's not like the the rebellious children who sneak out to like the neighbor's party. It's like I'm going to sneak out and travel when I'm a <laughs> yeah, teenager. Sure. I go and cycle the maritimes of, of Canada, right? So, I, you know, that was one of my things is I cycled the maritime provinces. What so. is the maritime provinces? Oh, sorry. Um, New Brunswick, P Prince Edward Island. Actually, it was mostly Prince Edward Island, Prince Edward Island and uh, Nova Scotia. Cool. Yeah, I was just in Montreal for the first time uh, last summer, and uh, I know Scott was there recently as well. I think you've been there <laughs> we a few We have to both be there at the same time, but we didn't connect. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a great town. That's a really great town. I really, I really did enjoy it. And it's for I always tell people in the in like the new, the northeastern area of the United States, it's like drive up to Canada, like take a ride. It's so it's so close, and it you know it, it is you are in another country, and it is it is a unique experience. Yeah, yeah, and you get into Montreal, and the culture is Cultures, so diverse, yeah. right? Because you've got the French culture and the English culture, and the merging of those, and then you you know go up, uh, go east for another couple of hours, and you're in Quebec City, and that's like going to Europe. Yeah. Right. So if you you know if you want a little bit of the European flair and not travel to Europe, that's it's a great place to go. This time of year, it is very very cold. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, uh, Scott. We just dropped your video. Hopefully, he comes back on. Usually, the recorder will continue to go. So, oh, okay. Um, give him one sec. Hey, Scott, you there? Yeah, I popped out. I'm not sure uh, what the deal was. If you no, if you didn't hear me, I just said, <clears throat> not sure how anything could be colder than Michigan, but uh, <laughs> I believe you. Yeah, I think Quebec City can be colder than Michigan. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Scott, hopefully your video comes on in a sec. We'll just continue, and we usually roll with things like this. So um, <laughs> what happened, Janice? And oh, Okay, there we go. Yeah. So it was you and, you and your husband had, uh, I know you were doing conferences, shows, a publishing company, et cetera, and then... Kind of, can you start from there and then take us into what happened in, in 2009 and yeah, sort of um, sparked your, your blog? Yeah, we both, my husband and I were both uh, real travelers. And, um, uh, you know, as soon as we made a profit, <laughs> our company was like all spent on travel. <laughs> um, so, and then we actually were fortunate enough to sell the company. And so in 2001 we uh, took off as a family and traveled Europe for a year, uh, for 10 months. 
and um, it was Europe because he'd done South America in the seventies. You know, oh, cool. so oh. yeah, which was pretty adventurous, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, uh, anyway, so we did Europe for ten months, and uh, and then when we came back, discovered that he was ill, and he passed away in '06, and uh, and then you know the the whole grieving process is not a straightforward one, and you go up and down, and you think you're up and out of it, and then you go down again, and and in oh. uh, '09, so I'm I'm heading into my third year, and uh, I felt myself diving again and um, this time it was like I didn't I didn't want to do this anymore and for some reason like I was sitting on a couch Saturday afternoon in February not a great time and um, and I felt this and and for some reason I, I, I said or thought I guess I'm traveling solo and truly I don't know where it popped out of huh. it's not like I was thinking about travel and um, and so I picked up my computer I'm a, I was a freelance writer you know, for a number of years as well. Picked up my computer, Google solo travel, and the first site I didn't dig. The first site that came up was full of spam, right? Full of you know Google ads and you know flashy things. <laughs> it was really really bad. And I thought you know I can do better than this. And <laughs> so so I thought about it for a day. And the next day I started working on solo traveler and it took me a, a couple of months to really, cause I didn't know what blogging was or anything like that. Mm -hmm. it took a couple of months to get it up. But, um, in April 30th, uh, I launched solo traveler. So, uh, so yeah, that's how, that's how it came about. It came about as, a uh, kind of a, a way of pulling myself out of a situation, mm -hmm. right? Um, it did, it absolutely launched me out of grief, wow. which is a mm -hmm. pretty sweet thing. And um, and gave me this new focus because I like you guys I'm entrepreneurial, and uh, I need to have something on the go. And uh, so it was just this. It's for me this whole project is this wonderful intersection of my entrepreneurial side, my writing skills, my love of travel, and my need to learn because the need to learn is all like you just can't stop learning when it comes <laughs> to social media and the like because it moves so fast. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's how I came to, 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 to develop Solo Traveler and, and why it's so great for me. <laughs> it's, that's awesome. And, and, and also, you know, I hope and the feedback I receive from my readers as well. Beautiful. Yeah, it sounds like I know you said it <clears throat> quickly, but, you know, three years of, of a roller coaster ride of, of, of grieving and things like that, it's, it sounds, I know you, you said it quickly, but it's, it must have been quite, quite a challenging time in, in, in your life. Yeah. Absolutely. And then to uh, to find something sort of uh, it was a neat a neat spark, and how you did it did it so fast. So it's that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, and I and I know a lot of people um, struggle with this issue. You know, like whether you're grieving a, a divorce or breakup of any sort or um, or a loss. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's a hard thing for people to go through, and uh, and so I have readers. You know, at all stages of life, from their twenties to to their sixties, you know, and I'll have them email me going, oh, "I'm just doing this, and can I travel solo? I'm not sure I can do it." You know, it's kind of like you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I just had somebody uh, yesterday say the same thing, like, "You know, do you travel solo very often?" I said, um, "You know, about half the time." It's uh, a friend of mine that's kind of in a rut uh, career-wise and not really sure of what she wants to do and. She's like, I think I just have to go travel and kind of reset my brain and, and be somewhere where I could just kind of relax and get my thoughts together. And so I was, I was actually just talking with her last night, and I, I said, you know, that's a, a great idea. She's like, well, where do I go? I'm like, geez, uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure. Do you get questions like that? As to where to go, yeah, oh. yeah. Um, where to go, and, and I've kind of analyzed that whole process as to what mm -hmm. your level of experience with travel is, what right. your level of experience with being alone is. And and how to how to break it down is in terms of options, but you know I mean I put it up on Facebook a couple of days ago saying I'm trying to figure out my 2014 travel plans and there's just so much and I don't know what to do and over a hundred oh, people yeah. went I'm in the same position I don't know what to do <laughs> That's my world right <laughs> you know, oh yeah it is tough you, and, you know reading books is a really good thing because then you get inspired and you want to go and and see that place that was described or whatever. 
you know, there's various ways of kind of figuring out where you want to go, but it is a tough one. Yeah, yeah but the, the <clears> thing <throat> is, when I read books and when I read blogs, it just increases the already overwhelming list of places I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there is reality, right? There's the financial reality, you know, that we deal with, and there's a time length of reality, and, and these things will affect narrow down the list in certain ways, at least for, for most people. Not mm -hmm. many people have the, the luxury of traveling all the time. Right. Is, is there a book that you often recommend to, to people or, or one that's been influential in, in your experience? Just, see, I like to read fiction. Mm -hmm. So um, while I do read some nonfiction, you know, um, reading a good one now, but, uh, but I like to read fiction and therefore it's the, it's the um, genre of the fiction and it's just the, it's, I guess, the, in, the inspiration to travel where the story is taking place is, is incidental to my choice of fiction. And then the, the desire to go there comes out of the fiction. You know, it, it, uh, Use it's your not imagine it. a, a, you know, a tactical strategic <laughs> precision that I'm doing here. No, it's no. Just, it just happens, right? I'm a member of a book club in my neighborhood. We read books and go, oh, yeah, and, and then, you know, kind of go from there. How, how often is it, uh, just because I've been in this situation before, how often is it that uh, when you travel somewhere, it's exactly how you imagined it would be? Uh, you know, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> it's a really interesting question. Um, hmm. no, I, you know what? I don't, like, the, like I, I do separate the books from the reality. Mm -hmm. And so I don't go there really expecting to see what I had in my brain. Right. But um, so I kind of go with a, a, a blank slate, so to speak. I do go that way, I think. Mm, that's good. Because I've never been asked about that before, but that's a really interesting question. <laughs> yeah, I think that I go with a more or less blank slate and then, you know, see what, see what it presents me. But, right. you know, I think it's, it's just really important because, um, like, I... I did my master's in history, so history is really interesting to me. But I think this whole idea as to what you're expecting versus what you see is a really important thing, and, and it really affects your yeah. understanding of history. And uh, so to, to get in a place to see the geography, to see the culture and how it's playing out, helps one understand the history as well. So I've kind of gone on a segue here. I'm sorry. No, but no, no. We love segues. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's what, it's like, that's where good conversation takes place. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> and this, uh, the, this, yeah. So, um, so yeah, kind of having this kind of open mind as to what you're going to see, I think, is really important. And and you know, and, and I think that that's like when it comes to solo travel and your friend who's just thinking of going, um, it's a really important part of traveling solo because you can get into a new city, and I, it still happens to me: a new city, a new location, and I go, "What am I doing here? Why am I here?" <laughs> <laughs> and um, and can I handle this, right? Mm -hmm. So that whole piece of you know standing or sitting and waiting and watching and seeing how it functions and all that type of thing um, is not only a part of the experience of exploring a new location, but it's also part of a solo traveler landing, feeling confident and comfortable with where they are and what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of solo travel is definitely like an, an internal process too. Getting to a lot of times, I <clears throat> was telling Scott, you know, there's times I get I get quite stressed out, like when I'm in certain situations. Depending on, like for example, I was just down in Colombia and uh, some finances ran low for a little bit and just wasn't able to get a lot of work done and a bunch of stuff. And I had some confusion about a bunch of things and definitely had a few days of like, what the heck am I doing? What's going on with all these things? I spent a lot of days, you know, going for like long walks and journaling. But uh, after I came back and got and got settled. Like every time people are like, oh, how was Colombia? How was your trip? And I'm like, it was amazing. Like I've learned so many things, like the conversations, the people I was with, sort of what I, what I take from it. Uh, and in the past, I've done probably at least three or four, four solo trips to, to other countries and find those are, are phenomenal. And I like to, solo trips are fun because you don't have to, you don't have to ask you, the people you're with, oh, what do you want to do? Oh, we want to go here. What do you, <laughs> you just go out and you do whatever you want. Or, you know, it makes it... Um, you know, it can be quite tedious. That the, bra <laughs> the, the bane of progress everywhere. <laughs> group, <laughs> group consensus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think the thing that you picked up on there about, about uh, conversation is really, really important because, you know, as you travel solo, I, I mean, for, for me and, and, and most of the people that uh, within the community that I relate to, um, you meet more people, more locals, more travelers, 
uh, because you're alone. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Then you do when you're with others. I mean, people, people when if they see you with someone else and you're kind of communicating like this, um, they don't step in. But if you're solo and you're just kind of open to the world, I mean, people step in and they the most amazing things happen. I always tell people that that's that's uh, something that I found also to be true, and and it was interesting after I, I would always travel solo. Um, most of the time, but I would go somewhere where I knew people or, or whatnot, and then I'd I'd connect with them. But when I first started, the real solo travel was about the same time as you started your your blog uh, in 2009, and I went on a few trips by myself, and it was really uh, it was tough to do at first because I I wasn't used to it, and it's like you know uh, who am I going to share stories with? Who am I going to talk with? Who am I going to decide on what to do with? And uh, it was it was intimidating, even though I'd already traveled for eight years or so, uh, pretty extensively. Uh, you know, it was it was something that took some time to get into. Uh, mm-hmm. but once I did it, it was very easy. And then I I kind of had the same things happen to me where <clears throat> people would just come up to me, um, like when I was on the Trans Siberian Express, and they would just give me give me vodka or or give me tea or or whatever. And and I found the same thing to be true. <clears throat> I wonder. I was wondering if um, how I mentioned that you don't have anybody to kind of reminisce on your travels with after the fact. You don't have anybody to kind of share those those stories with. Do you find that your writing is an outlet in much the same way that you would talk to somebody about a trip later on? Do you feel that, that writing about it kind of serves the same purpose? Um, to some degree, yeah, because uh, it's a record. Mm-hmm. And I write in a very conversational style, so yes. I'm, writing, I'm writing to my readers. That's that's and, what I, I kind of got that that kind of feeling. Yeah. 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 So um, so it does it does provide that kind of outlet to some degree, um, but you know the whole reminiscing thing, uh, the the thing this. I, I have lots of friends <laughs> that yeah. want to hear the stories, so. Um, <laughs> So for them, I mean, my friends don't read the blog, mm-hmm. right? Because they, they get it firsthand and they want to hear this story or that story or things like that. So I don't find that I'm short of the opportunities to reminisce mm-hmm. at all. Um, sometimes, you know, when I'm traveling, there'd be like an occasion where I want to go, oh, look at that. Or what I remember coming out of a, a, out of a play in New York City one time and I was just like spinning around the lot <laughs> because I wanted to talk to someone about it. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, I think that's probably the, the, the time when I most missed having someone there. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, more of an intellectual exchange than a, than a, wow, look at the sunset exchange. Yeah. Yeah. You want to compare notes. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, it was really that. But so that doesn't happen very often. Plus, you know, I end up traveling with people most, you know, often. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's not an uncommon situation whether you pick up and travel with someone for four or five days or a week or two weeks or whatever, you know, um, and then say goodbye. Right. Yep. And stay friends on Facebook and, uh, you know, um, so there's, there is, there's lots of opportunity to share the experience. Do you do you find I so I always I always have so many questions for people that are that are well traveled you know just because it's uh, it's interesting an interesting meeting of the minds uh, do you find that uh, that travel uh, especially solo travel has made you very good at saying goodbye? Um, I don't I don't know that I would say it would make made me good at saying at saying goodbye. I think. No, I think that it's just it's just the nature of the relationship right. that that a goodbye is inevitable. It's part of the arc of the of you know our story together, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we know there's going to be a goodbye at the end of it, and away we go. Mm-hmm. So right. I I don't think that I mean solo travel um, has done a lot of things. It's made me better at a lot of things, right? Mm-hmm. Made me better at <clears throat> assessing a situation quickly. Made me better at feeling confident about myself, whether traveling or at home. You know, the, the whole idea of the things that I learn about myself as I travel and then bring home and integrate into my life, like, that's, that's the learning that goes on for me when I travel. Yeah, beautiful, yeah. Yeah, I had, I, to, to piggyback on that, I did, write, <clears throat> I did write that down. From your experience, I know when we first jumped on, Janice, what did you, what did you call it? You said, it's, you know, my blog's not about like the heartbreak solo. <laughs> what was the word you <laughs> used? It's not. It's not that kind of like. It's not We're that. Not it's the Lonely Hearts Club. Here. The Lonely Hearts Club. <laughs> and, and and in your experience, what you were just um, 
which you just mentioned one example. Could you give a few more of like what, uh, whether it be like through through actual, just if you have a story for us or a few different sort of nuggets or, or, or bullet points, but what are the benefits of, of traveling solo that you've been able to uncover and incorporate into your life? And what have you learned through, because uh, I mean, you've been doing it for, you know, so you said uh, 15. I mean, you, you must, uh, besides learning more about yourself, uh, you know, what other benefits does it have? And and also, like you mentioned, uh, getting over tough times in your life, whether it be with grief or or transitioning into a new job or a new phase of your life. Mm-hmm. There's there's lots to be learned. I, I actually wrote in the first year of my blog. I wrote this little ebook called um, "Glad You're Not Here: <laughs> um, A Solo Traveler's Manifesto." Mm-hmm. And, um, and what it does is it kind of goes through different life stages and say, says why solo travel is such, such a good thing. And, you know, one of them in, in your 20s is it's a good thing to go out and figure out what you really want to do, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, for women in their 50s especially because women often, you know, are raising kids and, you know, very, very focused on others. True. Empty yeah. nest, go out and figure out who you are. But it all comes down to kind of understanding who you are when no one's looking, so to speak, right? So we're all defined, we, you know, we, we grow up and we're defined by other people. Their, <clears throat> their expectations of us, um, you know, whether how we think, what we want to do, what, how we react, that type of thing, excuse me. <clears throat> we, all but, have, we all have ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's all about people. Um, so to, to be able to go out in the world and operate without those expectations, people having the expectations around us, is a really valuable experience. You understand whether you're a morning person or a night person, really, as opposed to what is required of you to be, right? right. You discover that, you know, how, how active you want to be during the day. You discover, um, you know, you go through a museum, which is something that you've always done with someone, and then you realize, no, you know what? I actually hate museums. I'm not <laughs> You know, whatever it is, you get <laughs> you get to learn more about yourself, and so um, so that's kind of the common thread that goes through it all. Whether it's about knowing more about yourself, so you can figure out what your next career step is, knowing about yourself, so that you can figure out you know how you want to spend um, you know your retirement time, whatever it is. But that time to figure out yourself is really, really important. That's you know one aspect of it. The other really big benefit is confidence. It grows yeah. with confidence like nothing else. That's so true. Good. There is definitely I've I've been in, in groups of with travelers and in groups of people who I know have more life experience and others who have just you know they've only been to like two or three cities, all which which are within their 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 own their home country. And people who, who have seen and experienced and tasted life on different on different soil are definitely, it's a different, uh, it's, it's almost ha- challenging to explain. Like Scott and I, we've <clears throat> hung out with groups of just, I forget where we were. We were in, we were in Portland and we were walking around with like, there were five guys and everyone's sort of entrepreneurial and a traveler. And it's like, the group's just like, do everyone's doing whatever they want. Like it, it was just, it was so interesting to see this, like to see yeah. five uh, such independent guys all together. And it's really nice when like they get together, but there was no, like no expectation. There was no neediness among people. There was no like boasting or yeah. There was no BS uh, drama or anything. It was it was like fun. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like hey, like, I'm going over here. I'll, like and it's like I'm not even. <laughs> I'm not worried about you. Don't worry about me. I'll see you back in a day or so. And uh, it was uh, it was like that when we were down in Colombia. We're like all right, yeah, I'll, I'll catch you. Uh, I'll see you in the like I'll see you in Medellin in a couple of days. All right, bye. Like, <laughs> yeah. Figure it out. We'll, we'll see you on the you know way to change flights and things like that. But um, it's <clears> it's wonderful and you're changing things on the fly. And and uh, and you're with people that I you know, are like minded. It's yeah. you know I agree when you, when you're with real travelers because at home you know I have great friends and our interests overlap in different ways. True. But when I'm traveling and, and especially when I run into long term travelers because I don't I'm not a long term traveler anymore. I'm like mm. two weeks three weeks that type of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> but when I run into long term travelers like I click. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. That that instant <laughs> click <clears throat> amongst yeah. travelers. Yeah. So you also run a group in uh, um, in your area in Toronto, I believe. The, I, I'm, I'm going to flip it around, but I know it's like Plan Meet Go Meet Plan. What? Oh, it's Meet Plan Go. Actually, Meet Plan Go <clears throat> is um, is that Warren um, and Betsy's like group or no? Or? It's not Warren and Betsy's. Oh, okay. it, it's um, uh, Sherry Ott. Sherry. Okay. Yeah. I and, think I might have uh, seen them talk about Sherry. I know I saw those yeah, words before. We've cased a backpack. 
And uh, and so they, yeah, we ran it for three years. She didn't run it this year. So it was like the same day in like, I don't know, 10 locations around um, North America. Well, North America because I'm in Toronto. Otherwise, it was in America. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, we just had an, an evening meetup and put together a panel of speakers, all who had, all who had done long-term travel, you know, usually a family, a couple, and a solo. And, um, and then, you know, do some sort of presentation, each of them present, and then Q&A from the audience. And, and that, again, is a situation where the feedback that I would get is people were just like, this is so great. Finally, I'm in a room of people that get me. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. always nice when, <laughs> when I was down, uh, a friend was talking to her down in Columbia, and he's like, talking about some ideas and his brain was just like spinning off here. And it was like, he's like, oh, I'm just like, I just got so much going on. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm just like you, man. It's, <laughs> it's really cool. Like it, um, it does make it nice. But going back to the thing we were talking about a, a second ago, for me, I've realized that traveling solo, you know, once you kind of just, uh, you, you, you force yourself to get there, to get to that new country, you're not going to die. Like you're really not going to die. So because of, because you, that is just instinctually there, you're forced to be creative, to problem solve, um, for me, like creativity or just like, you know, it's like, oh, we can't, um, like Scott and I have this rickshaw run coming up in a few months. And it's like, it's like, no matter what happens, you, you have to solve it. You have to press forward. No safety net. Yeah. There's, there's no, like, there's no falling back on and like calling your friend to send you money or this. It's like, you need to get it done. Oh, the shop closes at eight. Well, you, you need to call the guy and you need to figure, see if you can open it up early and bribe him with a breakfast or like, you just, <laughs> you get this whole entire like the the words no or, or or impossible or things can't be done. You're like no, screw that. I'm gonna figure it out because I figure I figured out a lot worse stuff on the road <laughs> with no cell phone, no friends, no language, et cetera. It definitely, it's amazing, isn't yeah, it? It certainly yeah. does build um, build a lot of confidence. Certainly. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and and I think you're right. No, you're not gonna die, right? The chance <laughs> of dying is not that great. Yeah. And and uh, so you know, I I have told people and I've written about. It, I said, like, you know where to get food. A grocery store or a restaurant, just the same as home. Every <laughs> person wants, just the same as home. Right? You know where to sleep: a hotel, a, a hostel, B and B. Just the Wait, same. Are as you home. saying that they have hotels and grocery stores in other countries? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> but, it's like this, they're almost like us. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but it's it's that it's that unknown that people fear, and they don't even know what the unknown is. Yeah. Right. So when you just when you just simplify it like that, you know, you know how to get food, you know how to you know how to you know get a bed. Yeah. So you're okay, right? Then like you actually I use the buses at home, right? Huh. There's, there's tra local transit, so you know just kind of layering it on a little bit, a little bit, and you kind of bring people along to the point they go, oh, yeah, I guess I can do this. <laughs> yeah. And and through through your solo travel society and through your blog. Uh, I know that you must get a lot of questions from people that are kind of dipping their toe in the water or at least want to do that. Um, what are people's excuse, excuses slash fears? Like what are the most common ones and how would you approach them to get around those, those roadblocks? <clears throat> well, the, big, the biggest uh, – it varies, right? Some people are more afraid of being lonely. This is top three. There's, okay. There are top three. Okay. So there's fear of being lonely. Right, alone, lonely. Fear of your safety, and then eating in a restaurant alone. <laughs> you can believe really? it, it's up there. <laughs> huh. Yeah, it's very funny. It's very up there. Yeah, it's a, that's like a it's a really the social pressure. Or how, how far you know out of the norm it is to be sitting by yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but the thing is that to do, to address that one first, um, what people don't realize is that. You know, when you're sitting at alone in your own hometown or city or whatever, in a restaurant, you feel like, well, I should have friends around me, right? It's kind of like, am I lame? You know, that right, kind of, right. right? Whereas when you're traveling and you're doing this, ah, no, like you are cool and you're <laughs> there and you're strong and it's a different, it's a different scene, right? And you meet someone and they go, really? You're traveling on your own? Oh my God, you're amazing, right? It changes, it changes it completely. So the whole thing about being lonely, yeah, use some technology if you need to, right? Instagram, Facebook, you know, Facebook post, whatever, right? So they, you know, there is that fear of being lonely. And then safety, I do write about safety quite extensively. Mm -hmm. um, there's all sorts of ways to be, to be safe. And, uh, and it's, uh, there's a whole section of my book about safety. But when it comes <clears throat> down to 
I think I've got like five principles of safety just to, you know, just, you know stay in public. Mm -hmm. Don't go into private with people that you don't, private places, people you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, which, of course, we all as travelers break all the time. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, for someone who's new and just getting an assessment of the situation, I think that's a really important rule. It's a good yeah. framework to have. Right. Yeah. Um, I can't remember all of them. Uh, be, be, you know, uh, be willing to be rude. Yeah. Mm. Right. You know, we're also taught to be very polite and keep our voices down and things like this. You know, if you get a woman with a little voice, you go into the basement and you scream, learn how to use your voice. Right. And don't be afraid to use it. You probably won't need to. But there's times you need to say no or tell someone, I, you know, I don't, I don't like what you're doing or I know I'm not going on. I'm not taking this road trip or whatever it be. Cause yeah. 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 So, you know, there are some, I, I'm sorry, I wish I, I had them right in front of me, but there are about five, it's on my book, on my, we'll, my, we'll, my, we'll put a link to it below, yeah. Safety, yeah. Five principles of safety, yeah. yeah. yeah so it's like uh, Danny, <clears throat> Matt, it's like what Danny was saying in Colombia, our, our mutual friend, um, he spent a lot of time in South America, and he used to worry about, you know, kids would kind of play around him and... He was worried about uh, them trying to pickpocket him, but he didn't want to be rude and just like, you know, grab his things and turn away or go somewhere else uh, until it actually happened. One of the kids just stole some of his stuff and he's like, you know what, now I don't worry about being rude. He's like, if I feel, you know, uh, afraid of, uh, for my safety or my belongings, I get the heck out of there or I say or I do something and I don't worry about what the other person is going to think of me. Yeah. 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 So yeah the other thing to do with it in terms of safety is to be really aware of the culture you're in. So um, I was in India, and uh, it took me a while to figure this one out, but it really works. And I, you know, always being approached by men, you know, let me do this. Oh for you. yes, yes. yeah. Right. And um, well, you know, are they just are they just they want to help you with anything? Kind of what what are yeah some? the ones that are on the platform that mm -hmm. want to take your bags for you and get you a rickshaw or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Tuck tuck. And um, but one of the things that I learned is like tap into the culture. What would women in that culture do? So in this case, uh, you know, I finally said, my brother does not allow me to speak to strange men. And he was gone. Wow. Huh. So that's, that's good so pickup. That, yeah, it's really, it's a really, um, to be really aware of what the cultural norms are. And uh, if the cultural norms are not, you know, men should not be approaching women, you mm. use that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. they, they can mm. certainly take advantage of that because they know that most people don't know those those little nuances. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Huh. When, um, when did you start writing professionally? I know you said you were a freelance writer before you started up your blog and, and, and whatnot, but. I ain't going to find out how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't have to say how many years ago. Just say, uh, no, I, don't I don't know. know how old I, am. Okay. No, I actually um, started writing in the late eighties Okay. and, uh, and it's kind of been a, part of my life and then not. So I was freelance in the late 80s. Then um, the conference and um, uh, trade pub business that I had, I was an editor there. So I was again kind of professional there. And then when, when my husband um, was ill and after we'd sold, my brother actually came to me and said, you have to do something. You are a writer. Start picking up some jobs because you know you can't just focus on on him, you have to you have to build some sort of life for yourself. Mm -hmm. So he actually brought me my first client, and uh, and then I built this writing practice up, which I let go um, as the blog grew. I let the writing practice go, and mm -hmm. so it's just this lovely dovetailing of of uh, jobs. Did you learn? Did you go to school, or did you just did you just pick up writing, and did you kind of uh, direct your own education in that as aspect? I I didn't go to school. I love it. <laughs> I'm good at I'm good, good at copying. And I'm not copying. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> oh my god! No, but good at at breaking apart what the structure is and right. and how you know for whether it's a press release or you know a sales letter or uh, a guide or you know and um, I can I can break it apart and go okay this is how it's structured and, and off I go, um, but. You know, when I started the blog, it was so wonderful to be free to of clients. Break all the rules Just and do whatever you want. Ever I want it, right? Like this to to write in your own voice is a real privilege. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no editor uh, looking it over, changing some things here and there. That's right. That's right. Except for I've got a proofreader. That's oh, good. 
Because I'm not a good speller. <laughs> well, that's what uh, spell correct is for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, still, <laughs> still make some mistakes. Janice, among all all the questions you get, what's the question that you don't get that you that you wish people had asked, or that you that would be beneficial for them? Oh goodness. Ah, <coughs> uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, that's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, it is. we can but, circle back around. We can, we can yeah. set it aside, and if it pops up, we can. Okay. Yeah, that's a tough question. Yeah, it's kind of like, or like the thing that people, you know, maybe, <clears throat> like for me, I didn't, you know, uh, which, like when I first started traveling, I didn't really look at finances so much. I just kind of like knew it was important and I made it happen. And like, I had to learn through that, that, you know, being a little bit, little bit more financi financially cognizant uh, was important. And some people may or may not overlook that or like kind of areas that people, um, yeah, I'm like re-asking the question in another way. Yeah, yeah. No, that's actually a bit helpful. And and I guess, you know, the, the question that people should ask me is, if, is whether or not I follow all of the recommendations that I make hmm. in terms of safety, in terms of savings, in terms of budgeting, in terms of everything. Do I follow everything I recommend? I'm guessing ask no. <laughs> I, I think everyone is like that. I always I always get a little bit frustrated. Um, not, you know, yeah, I guess frustrated when people are like, Oh, well, I'm reading this book and so and so is giving me financial advice. And then, like, later on, there's some news article that this guy's not. And it's like, hey, we're all Isn't human. Yeah. We're all, we are trying, we're all trying to do everything that we write about and that we share about. Um, I think not only is it important to have the sort of the, be able to not have to follow your own rules, but also for me, like, I've written about things a year ago that have now, I've matured in my awareness of it. And it's, it's not that it's not correct. It's like, ah, I'm just at a more evolved area of that. So I'm now doing it differently. Or like, you know, you don't want to, as a writer or as someone who shares, you don't want to be held to like having to do everything that you've wrote, written about. You know, I, hey, I wrote that eight years ago. I'm different now, you know? <laughs> no, that's, that's very true. That's very true. There's that evolution side of it. But also for me, because the blog is, you know, as, a, as how to, as well as a reflection of the stories and the, the experiences I live, the how to portions, I, you know, have a responsibility, I feel, to write for people that may not have the intuitive sense of the world that I have. Yeah. Right? So um, while the thing of, of not going into private with someone I've just met is something that I very rarely would break. Very rarely. Mm. Um, because I do think that... Uh, you know, being in a different culture, different place, it's hard to read people. And <clears throat> I've been in a con situation, and you know, cons are what they are. They're cons. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, that's not one that I break. But you know, lots of other ones, yeah, because because I have a different sense of being on the road than so than someone else does, and the way I write has to be, you know, responsible so that everyone can take from it what they want to and then leave behind what they want to. You could, you could read people in situations in a way that isn't easy for the novice traveler to pick up right away. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't, I don't take it's, I don't consider, you know, the recommendations I make frivolous. I'm, I don't, I, I, I don't approach it in that manner. Mm -hmm. I take responsibility for what I'm saying. And, uh, Though there's that wonderful disclaimer on my site <laughs> at all times. <laughs> You know, I do try to I do try to, to be responsible in how I communicate those things. And for that very reason, yes, I break some of my own rules. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, recommendations. All right. As someone who, who publishes, uh, whether it be and I think a lot of people can relate to this, whether it be writing or, or photography or videos, the balance of being present in, in the moment when you're traveling, but also in the back of your mind, knowing that this is going to become public information, so that kind of might alter or change the way you have you found sort of a way to balance that because there's some trips I go on where I'm like wow I'm taking way too many photos because I know I need to publish some of these and I wasn't as present as I was with my mom at the gardens when we we're looking at the gardens because I'm just taking all of these pictures and other times where I'm so just enjoying where I am and the people that I'm with that I don't document any of it whether it be writing or videos or, or photography have you found that uh, was that easier already kind of being a writer or you found a balance to that I, that's a really hard balance. That's a really hard balance because you know I inevitably you know think I've taken tons of pictures, get back to do a uh, a post on something, and discover I just don't have the photos that go <laughs> what I'm writing. Yeah. Because you know for one reason, for one reason is that um, uh, the process of writing 
you know, the, the experience has to be distilled first. It has, to, it has to land inside of me before I can start sharing it. So I don't know in advance when I, when I have the opportunity to take the photos, I don't know what the photos are that are going to be needed for the story that's going to come out of it. Mm-hmm. Right? So I often end up with a story that doesn't have the photos that I really want to match with it. Mm. So that's a little bit frustrating. And, um, and I don't want to, like I want, the, I want the experience to be real so that, um, and that's I think what the readers all want. Oh, you yeah. know, they don't want something that, that has been kind of constructed. They want something that has been freely lived and then shared. Um, and, uh, and so if you're, too, if you're too self-conscious about having to document it, well then, you know, <laughs> you don't, you're, like you're, you're defeating yourself there. So it's, it's a, I find it a <laughs> difficult balance. Yeah. And same. if anything, I land on the side of um, living it rather than documenting Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a bit envious as to uh, your your body of work. I mean, it just seems like you've got so much out there. Uh, and and I was, it's funny, Madison asked the same thing just because I struggle with that as well, uh, either documenting it or experiencing it, uh, you know, in my head. You know, you do one or the other, and it's really tough for me to do both. And it's also tough for me to find time to write. Um, I know you can you can go on some trips that are a little bit shorter. Uh, kind of keep everything in your head or maybe refer back to pictures later on and then write about it. But oftentimes I'll be doing these uh, four-week-plus trips. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm experiencing so much. If I don't write that down, uh, like, you know, oftentimes that day, uh, things will just kind of get bunched up together in my head and I won't be able to, like, kind of pick out what happened on what day. And yeah. so I found it really tough uh, to actually, at the end of the day, I'm tired I would just want to go to bed. I'm like, I'll do it tomorrow. Inevitably, it doesn't happen. You know, do you do you chronicle things as it happens? You know, with notes or a voice recorder or whatnot on your trips, and then come back to it later when you're writing. Yeah. See, that's the thing is that if I did that, then I would be you know um, interjecting that into the experience, and so mm-hmm. so the experience is then compromised. And and it is. It's a really difficult thing. I try to keep a journal, but the journal is simply like date, place. You know, mm. person's name, what I ate, maybe. Because uh, I come back and, I, and, you know, Tracy, my editor, um, is, the, is really the foodie. And she'll go, well, what did you have? I go, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was meat on the plate, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I used to say. But I'm, when I went to India, I, turned, I became a vegetarian out of nowhere. Cool. <laughs> and I've not been able to face meat since. So, oh. And that is in- inexplicable. I can't explain it. So. Um, <laughs> But so I do try to I do try to document um, document what I can. But again, I don't I don't always make it. It just doesn't always happen mm-hmm. uh, because you know sometimes this great you know an evening out that was nothing turns into something, and you know you come back at midnight or one o'clock, and but oh you got a flight out the next morning. You know like it just doesn't always happen. right. Yeah, but right. I, I mean I would I would say to um, between the two, I would err on the on the side of the experience as opposed to documenting. At Jared. least I do. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about um, one of your more memorable trips, uh, and if and if you've had one that you've sort of taken on a whim, where it was like last last minute you decided I'm going to go to, you know, so and so, and you just sort of you kind of went there with an open mind, no expectations, and it turned out to be something quite quite magical or just something that was important and had an impact. Well, India was. Um, not well planned. <laughs> I just kind of, I, 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 I was planning to go. I hadn't had time to plan it. Where'd you fly into? Uh, into Delhi. Okay. And, um, but I flew, I ended up flying in with this woman and her husband. I'd actually booked my flight, hadn't planned anything. Um, other than, I think there's this ashram that I think I'm going to go to. Like, that's as far as I got. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rajasthan was going to be an area I would explore. Nice. Just like everybody, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then I was in an Indian restaurant, and the owner started talking to the woman, the owner, and she goes, well, we're going to my brother's wedding in two weeks, and you must come with us, right? <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> yeah. So I changed my flight. I went with them to Delhi. There, a car, I mean, we ended up in this town. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember this. It's a, like, it's a small town. Mm-hmm. No one goes there. People were staring at me. <laughs> Right, a young a young girl said, "How do you get your skin so fair?" <laughs> truly, truly, like I was off. 
the beaten track. <laughs> <laughs> no one goes there. And um, so a car picked us up and took us there. So I was there for about four or five days living with this family and, and you know, went to the wedding, the after parties and all the rest of it. It was extraordinary. And then they put me on a train. I went to the ashram. And at the ashram, I met this woman from England, Penny. And we ended up going to Rajasthan and, 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 uh, and touring together. So, you know, a, a, a trip that I hadn't planned turned into a really spectacular trip. Mm. Really spectacular trip. And, and I think that that's, a, you know, that whole balance between planning and not planning, right? Mm -hmm. I err on the, the not planning side. Same, yeah. And uh, Have some big bullet points to hit, but then yeah. be loose in between there. Yeah. Yeah, like if I had not seen the Taj Mahal, I would have been desperate. Like that would have been terrible. <laughs> as a child, I remember seeing it and not believing it could be real. Yeah. Huh. Right? So this is something that I really wanted to see. And of course, Agra is just one awful city. <laughs> I just thought, whoa, you know, take the train in in the morning, get the train out at night. <laughs> Tell me to see Agra. You should, you should try a rickshaw through it. That's no fun at all. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you, you would have been driving it. I, was, I, dr I drove my own. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it was not my favorite city. But, but that's, you know, mm. that's the, that, you know, not needing to plan a whole lot, mm. right? I had some, I, I, I kind of, I knew which, which ashram I wanted to go to, right? And I knew what, the, what points in, in, um, uh, in Rajasthan that I wanted to go to. And then this, this young woman, Penny, who was about mm, 15 years younger than me, she... Um, uh, it sounds she, fun, though, the two of you guys, the, the two of you traveling together. It's neat. Yeah, but you know what? She was on a five-month trip, right? Uh, and this was her first stop. Oh. And she went to <laughs> India first, and this was her first solo trip. <laughs> I thought, honey. <laughs> way, to, way to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so, and Penny and I got along great and, uh, you know, so we shared our $10 a night rooms. <laughs> it's just, it's incredible. That's we had great. a really good time together. What, really good time what about together. some other, um, special or interesting countries that you, that you've been to maybe off the beaten path? Um, well, this is, I mean, I don't <clears throat> know how off the beaten path this is, well, it's clearly not because it's, it's kind of part of the gringo trail, but, um, uh, I did go to Chile, uh, flew into Santiago, and then went down and took the Navimag ferry through uh, the fjords in the south mm. to, to go to Torres del Paine mm. and hike there. And on that one, again, I met this a French woman who was 20-some-odd years, my junior, and, uh, and uh, really got along well with her. She has no Emmy. She's just a lovely person. And she and I, I when we got into... Porta Mont? No, Porta, Porta Natalis. Um, Porta Natalis. I always pronounce it. <laughs> um, when we got there, I canceled on the accommodation because I'd booked some refugios in the park. I canceled that. We went and uh, rented uh, a tent and sleeping bags and stuff because she didn't have any plans. So we just rented the gear and went and camped in the park together. So, you know, it's just magical. Yeah. It's a magical thing. Yeah. yeah. Life life is what happens when you're making other plans, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So stop making so many and just let it happen. I used to be a big big planner. Um <clears throat> and for some of the some of the trips I take you have to do that uh because there's visa requirements, there's certain exit and entry windows you have to stick to. Um but I found within the last 5 years of of solo traveler so that um it's kind of silly to plan it out like that. Like Matt said, just have a few things that you definitely want to see and then just kind of wing it on the way because chances are like 80% of your plans are not going to work out. Yeah. And it's always nice along the way you meet that one person that happens to be going on some uh, – exam for example, I was, in, I was in Israel last summer and <clears throat> someone's like, oh, hey, tomorrow myself and two friends, this guy's like an ex – not a mountaineer, but some like hiking professional. He had worked. He had worked there, and he was like, you know, we're we're sneaking into this resort or this reserve, or you know, <laughs> we're gonna hike it. I know the way, and I'm like, yeah, sure. So, you know, <laughs> drove through the West Bank for three hours, uh, camped out, like slept under the stars. I saw like the most miraculous star rainbow. It was just like a belt. It was like the belt of stars. It might have been like one of the edges of the 
of the Milky, Milky Way. Way. It was just so <clears throat> yeah. intense. I even took like a long exposure photo of it because I just wanted to – the photo doesn't do justice because like the view, it was just a, a, an intense band of stars. It's more than I'd ever seen. Slept out like the next morning, went on this like pretty scary, strenuous, but like turned out to be an amazing hike. And I like – I remember later that night just thinking there's no way in the heck I would have – ever even known to look for this place or, or yeah. thought it could have happened but because i was open and didn't you know yeah that sounds good it's those moments that make uh for me the trips the some of the most fun yeah be open okay. to what comes your way and, and be fluid right yeah. yeah absolutely you know i was in a small town st andrews by the sea new brunswick uh, a couple of years ago and um i had just come from uh t-bex right oh yeah mm -hmm. and toronto's it's, it's, it's in toronto every year is it no, 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 no. It, it was in Vancouver. They That's switch it around. I was pointing that one. It was <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, West. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was in Vancouver at the time, and I'd just come from Tebex, and one, there was one statement um, that was made there that was just like, it really went true to me. And, and the comment was, and it was from a Lonely Planet writer, and I cannot remember his name at the, off the top of my head. I wish I could credit him. But... It was um, the person you're talking to is probably not the person that knows is the person you want to talk to, but they know who you want to talk to, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. So, yeah. okay, so I tried to put it in practice. And the first little town I went to, I didn't find the guy. I, I found out who the guy was just from, a, just from a woman at the coffee shop. Is this a guy that you were specifically looking to? No, I just said, who's the guy about town? Who's the guy that's the character? That knows everything, and knows everybody. Right? Oh, that's, a good, that's a good question to ask. Yeah. I, I'd like that. Right? And so I asked, and she said, "Oh, that's so and so, and you'll find him up." It was Har Harley Haggerty. <laughs> that was his name, Harley Haggerty. Oh. And you'll find him up at that bar. I went, and the bar was closed. I was too late. Whatever. I don't know time of year. I have no idea. But anyways, it didn't work. So the next town, I tried it again, and I was in this little shop at St. Andrews by the Sea, and I said to the woman, "Who's the guy about town?" Right, you know, who's the guy I should know? And she said, well, that's James, James, I can't remember James' last name. Anyways, so I said, oh, okay, so where would I find him? And she just stepped out of her shop to point down to a pub down the street. And she said, oh, <laughs> there he is. He's walking in right now. That's where you would find him. <laughs> so, um, so I walked down the street and, no, can't get his last name. Anyway, so I walked down the street. And I walked and I said, Mr. So-and-so, I understand I should know you. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me just kind of like shocked for one second. And the other, the next second was like, well, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it turns out that this is the guy. Not only does he run the museum, kind of the historical museum in town, he also handles the music scene. He brings acts in and he sends locals out. And that night... A local boy was coming in from Nashville with his Grammy award-winning band on the way to a to a festival in Nova Scotia and huh. staying one night and playing at that pub. He said, Come back tonight, we'll hang out with the band. Wow. So wow. I you love know? that that question. Like I gotta Scott, we that we gotta add that's yeah. a, that, I think that's like, one of the coolest questions to ask. I've never I've never heard that and hadn't thought of that yet, but like who's the person in town? Because like every town has like those the characters that are just, they're, they're always That's around. They know everybody. They do interesting things. Um, <clears throat> I'll do random things like I will go into places and just ask when I'm in another country. I'll sit down and I'll, I'll say, for some reason, you seem like an interesting person. Can I ask you some life advice? And I just ask, I just start to talk to them about life and just, and I just, be, I just pretend like I'm like completely naive and like, you know, I, I don't give them a lot of details about what I'm doing, but I'm just like, you know, what have you experienced? What have you been through? And met a guy who used to work on airplane engines and, then he took his skill from that and he learned cameras. So he, got, he opened a camera repair shop and he had like lived in like, he traveled to like 80 different countries and he was like, he was in his late 80s. And I just, I sat with him for like two hours and I was like taking notes. Like it was, it was really interesting, but I, I definitely like, uh, I definitely like that one. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, no, that, that one's good. I've, I've also done the, so tell me your story. What's your story? What's your story? Right? Everyone's yeah. got a story. What's your story? Yeah. And people like telling their story. Mm. Right? So that, that's that was been that's been my go to thing. This one, I kind of um, morphed it, the recommendation because he was talking from a journalistic point of view. You know, if you're going running down a story, you know, you keep on asking until you find the real until person. You find the but source. I did it for the small town thing to say like, 
who's, you know, who's the guy? Anyway, <laughs> so it is. It's very, it's very fun. But you really have to be in a small town or else no one yes. I mean, if you ask the guy around Toronto, it's like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the, the mayor? Oh, no, maybe not a great example. <laughs> like, <"Yeah>, because... <laughs> Please, <laughs> Like a written agreement, we weren't going there. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> Scott always has a trick up his sleeve. Just had, just had to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, John, uh, go ahead, Scott. I was just, I was going to say the same thing you're about to say, Matt. <laughs> go <laughs> ahead. Well, yeah. you go first in case it was. Uh, well, I, I know that we're uh, we're running short on time. I I wanted to hear a, uh, an overview of uh, why and how you started Full Flight Press and, and what it's all about. Oh, okay. Well, um, basically, I wrote uh, the Solo Traveler's Handbook uh, in 2011, and um, and you and know. What, then, and what is that? What is that handbook? Sorry, the Solo, the Solo Traveler's Handbook. Um, nice. It's a it's a book that's a combination of how to advice in terms of traveling solo, as well as a number of my solo travel stories and photos from my trips and things like this. So it's kind of a combination of inspiration and and practical advice. For, mm -hmm. for people traveling solo. And then I talked to a few bloggers that I have great respect for um, that are very strong in specific niches and said, well, what do you think? Let's, let's build this out because change solo for anything else and you have the Food Traveler's Handbook by Jody Ettenberg or mm -hmm. the Volunteer Traveler's Handbook by Shannon O'Donnell and et cetera, et cetera. So we now have eight Traveler's Handbooks in the series covering a wide range of travel from cruising to family to... Um, Luxury on a, on, on a budget, that type of thing. So there's a whole range of things. And adventure. Nellie, uh, Nellie Young went, uh, did adventure. My so, Ellie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's what the handbooks are about. You know, most guides out there are talking about the where of travel. These are talking about the how. Mm -hmm. And where could people go to, uh, to check that out and, and buy the books? Anywhere online. Right. So our site is thetravelershandbooks.com. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, W. H. Smith in the UK, uh, chapters in Canada—they all carry it online. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, both digital and paperback. Very nice. And I have uh, Scott. Unless you have one more, I have, I have one final question I'm going to ask you. And then let me just do what we do at the uh, end of our our shows. One of our routines is that we have a quote that I uh, prepare ahead of time. I have three here, and let's see. Um, <laughs> okay, I had I, I had two. It's interesting. I try to do a cold read on the guest beforehand and try to get a quote that I think will fit into what we're going to talk about. So <laughs> it's worked out every time so far. But um, before I wrap out and and uh, and close on our quote, first of all, Janice, thanks thanks for coming on. It's been uh, been fun hanging out. You're definitely um, right away as soon as you jumped on the call. I was like, I loved your energy and enthusiasm and um, mm -hmm. and what you're talking about and doing. And my my question is what. What drives you to keep doing what you are doing? You're writing, you're inspiring, you're educating, and you're <clears throat> you're continuing to, to push yourself and, and to grow. Where, what's where's that fire inside of you, or what what drives you to to do these all these things that you do and who you are? Yeah, I, I think that like at, at the beginning, solo was a pretty odd niche. Yeah, and um, you know, it just it's just seemed very very slow. But in the last few years, it's just been growing you know, incredibly fast and the feedback that I get and the the amount of interaction on the Solo Travel Society on Facebook, it's extraordinary. So, you know, every Monday and Thursday we actually post questions from people within the group and um, and everyone jumps, oh, not everyone, but lots of people jump in and share their expertise and so there's this, it's just developed into a really, really wonderful community and it's always presenting new opportunities. So. Last, uh, in December, I received an email from a reader who was saying, you know, I've just gone to this, this hostel or I, you know, I have trouble finding accommodation and sometimes I end up at a hostel, it's a party hostel, it's not what I want, yeah. you know, this type of thing, right? And uh, so he inspired the idea of an accommodation guide and so we're just now in the process of, oh, you guys could contribute, that would be great, um, uh, building out th through crowdsourcing an accommodation guide for solo travelers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the community will support it and bloggers and, and the like and um, uh, and we will hopefully build quite a nice resource uh, that will last, have, it should have a life of about a year I would think cool. and people can use it. So so these types of things happen, right, where the readers uh, inspire what the next move is. It, it's happened very organically and when something happens organically um, that's inspiring, mm -hmm. right? I think um, I mentioned to you at one point that 
um, I was thinking about a book club. Hmm, what about a book club? That would be fun, right? And then, <laughs> you know, that's that night. The next morning, I have an email from this woman said, I just read this book called 80 Days. It's so fabulous. It's about two women traveling solo around the world, you know, to beat Phileas Fogg's, you know, uh, uh, time. Record, yeah. And um, uh, And I'd really like to write a review for your site. I went, okay, a book club makes sense. <laughs> you know, when that type of thing happens, it just, it does, it keeps you going. You have projects that you have to complete and see to fruition and things of that sort. Yeah, and they're inspired, you know, organically through the, through the community. It, it's not, it's not just me pushing a ball up a hill. People, people <laughs> want to share. That's, I think that's something I've noticed, you know, when you are traveling. How many people are just like, oh, you're going there? Like, you have to hit up this, you have to stay here. Everyone yeah. wants to share their knowledge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's the wonderful thing about travelers, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah. It was so nice. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to wrap up on our quote here. So, uh, the quote I've chosen to, to close out today's show is by Henry Miller. The quote is one's destination is never a place, but a new way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. Janice, thanks so much for coming on. It's been, yeah, uh, it's been a ton of fun. Uh, who, if you guys, if you're listening or watching, uh, links to solotravelerblog.com and um, the guides, uh, the handbook guides that Janice mentioned. <clears throat> we'll have links below everything uh, below the video. And we appreciate you hanging with us and uh, hope you're inspired to, to go out there and whether it be eating at a restaurant solo or <laughs> into Very another scary. country, um, you know, in, in, embrace and, and embark on some solo travel. It's been, I think the three of us certainly know that it's, it's had a big impact on our lives and uh, and Janice, thanks again. Keep keep up all the great work that you're doing. I don't keep on keeping on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. It's been fun. Really all fun. Right. Fantastic. We'll talk soon. See you guys. Take care. Bye bye.